Well, brothers and sisters, first of all, I want to remind us all of a fact that I hope is pretty darn obvious, and that is that we have begun Lent. And in this holy season, of course, I encourage you all as a family to embrace those traditional practices of Lent, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. And these three practices have been with us since the very beginning of the church. Indeed, they have been really with us since the Old Testament. And just a couple of suggestions for you and your family as you enter into the season of renewal. As I told our grade school kids uh, last week, Lent actually comes from an old English word. Uh, I think that's right, not exactly a linguist, but comes from an old English word that means spring. Sort of counterintuitive. We don't oftentimes think about Lent as a time of spring, even though, admittedly, Lent oftentimes corresponds with the natural changes outside. We oftentimes think of Lent as, I'm so bad. Bleh. That's not the idea of Lent. The idea of Lent is a time of new beginnings, a time of renewal. Now, the fact is, is that that new beginning, that renewal, can only happen by overturning the soil. It can only happen by digging deeply into what is preventing us from surrendering to God and love of neighbor. And that, it can be very painful. So Lent is painful at times, but it's meant for renewal. It's pain for the sake of renewal. It's not pain for its own sake. We are not masochists as Catholics, contrary to what people might say. We embrace penance because we know to love is demanding. And we are training ourselves in love. So these three practices of loving, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, and helping us to love should be part of your family's life in these next 40 days. What might some suggestions be if you haven't yet figured it out? Prayer. One practical suggestion is to come to Stations of the Cross on Fridays. Every single Friday throughout Lent, here at Transfiguration, we have Stations of the Cross, a beautiful, powerful prayer. Stations of the Cross, I'm sure you're aware, was a way for uh, medieval Christians, Christians in the time of knights and things, to walk the Via Doloroso, the way of sorrow, the way of the cross, without having to travel all the way to Jerusalem. We know, of course, in the time of the Crusades, there was a lot of pilgrimages to the Holy Land in the time in which the Crusaders had control of that part of the world and Christianity was allowed to flourish. There were pilgrimages where Christians would travel to this part of the world and would walk the very way that Jesus had walked. Well, not everybody can do this, and not everybody can do this now. And yet what we can do is we can walk the way of the cross right here in church through our mind's eye, through faith, beautiful, powerful practice. Every single Friday, 7 p.m., we also have a, a fish fry beforehand with fish tacos, if that suits your fancy. But 7 o'clock stations right here in the main body of the church would encourage you to make this part of your family's practice. I still remember very vividly every Friday growing up, going to St. Mark's, sometimes begrudgingly, I admit, but walking that way of the cross. And I remember this vividly now as I think about my own formation in the faith as a child. I'd encourage you to make the Stations of the Cross a part of your family practice this Lent. Fasting, a couple of practical suggestions. Certainly uh, some more obvious ones are giving up sweets at home, giving up particular TV shows we like, maybe giving up TV altogether during the week. I know we're all getting in cold sweats when I say that, I know. But all of these ways in which we are reminded of how attached we are to things. I won't bore you with what I am giving up for Lent, but I got to tell you on Friday, I craved it deeply, okay? Two days in, two days in, and I wanted what I had given up. We are little children. We are little children with deep attachments. So I urge us all to find something that we as a family we know are just too attached to and to strive to let go of it, to feel, if you'll allow a, an expression that's taken a political turn these days, feel the burn, okay? Feel the burn. Feel the longing for that thing. Why? Number one, again, it reminds us of 
how attached we are to created things. But number two, it also inspires us for that feeling of longing that we should have for Jesus and for love. We experience what we should experience towards God. It's a reminder of uh, our own sentiments, our own uh, attractions, what they should feel when turned towards the Lord. And there's a kind of a, a training there. We let go of even goods. Good TV shows can be a good. A wonderful meal certainly is a good. And we let go of that to strive to yearn for the ultimate good who is God. How oftentimes we can dull our, our need for God or our awareness of our need for love through good things. Again, TV shows. I'm amazed how much Netflix one can gobble up in a day or in an evening or in an afternoon. Hours that could be spent in love of neighbor, in prayer, in meditating upon the scriptures, fasting. And then there is almsgiving, almsgiving, giving to the poor, serving the poor, serving the less fortunate. I've said many, many times before, because it is biblical, that our salvation is radically connected to our love for and our service of the poor. There is one scene, as I can recall it, within the Bible, within the gospel specifically, excuse me, where judgment happens. And on judgment day, given to us, this scene given to us by God himself, what does he say? He says, whatever you did for the least of my brothers and sisters, you did for me. He doesn't ask about a lot of other stuff. But he does say, what you did for the least, you did for me. Almsgiving, service of the poor, is a critical part of the Christian way of life. Indeed, I would say it is the, the hallmark of the Christian life, of the Christian society, of the Christian parish even. How are we treating, how are we loving the poor, the poor in our midst, the poor in our own family, the poor in our neighborhood? Brothers and sisters, uh, our budget, our monthly income, our yearly income, uh, and how we spend that income is a theological statement. It indicates what really matters to us. Now, brothers and sisters, I can have lots of warm, fuzzy feelings about Jesus, okay? But if my pocketbook doesn't indicate that I am a disciple, it doesn't really matter. At the end of my life, it won't really matter. I think Jesus will say to us, well, yeah, you said a lot of nice things, but what, what did you do? What did you do for the ones that I love, for my brothers and sisters? So almsgiving is about helping our neighbors, certainly financially, if we can, but also with our time, giving our, of our time to volunteer, to be of service to those who are the least among us. Almsgiving, especially for you young people in the parish, uh, oftentimes looks like that. It's volunteering. It's being present. Now, volunteering, how are you supposed to do that as a third or fourth or fifth grader? Well, perhaps one can volunteer one's time by reaching out to a classmate that is going through a difficult time, by reaching out to a sibling who is really having a, a time of loneliness, by reaching out to our parents even, who themselves can be the poor, in certain moments of sorrow, certain moments of being overwhelmed. What a beautiful thing to ask your mom or your dad, do you need a hug? That can be a kind of an almsgiving. We give to the poor. But for those who are adults, for those who are parents, I urge you to examine your checkbook and to see how you are spending your money. By the way, I would just offer that to support one's parish, while not exactly almsgiving, no it's not, no it's not, that is also a necessity of the Christian way of life, to financially support our parish. Prayer, fasting, and almsgiving must be a part of your family practice this season. And then I just would like to offer, before I dive into the real meat of this morning, confession. I urge you all as families to come to confession at least once during this holy season of Lent. We have confession a lot here at Transfiguration. Come on down. 
And no matter how long it has been since your last confession, no matter how ill-prepared you feel, come on in. We are eager to receive you with the Lord's love, with the Lord's mercy. I'm sometimes kind of astounded that there can be individuals who have been Catholics all of their life and practice in terms of coming to Mass with regularity, volunteer, serve the poor, serve the parish. But they haven't been to confession in years because it's hard. Because it's hard to admit one's failure. Because it's hard to say out loud, I messed up. I haven't done what I should do. But it's critically important, critically important. So I urge you, look at the schedule of confessions that we have. Saturdays in the mornings, Saturdays in the afternoons, Sundays in the morning, Tuesday in the morning, Thursday in the morning. In Lent, we'll have some extra confessions throughout Holy Week and make a point of coming to confession as a family this Lent. All right, let's talk about love. Love as the fulfillment of the new commandment. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ himself says that all of the law and the prophets are summarized in the commandment of love of God and love of neighbor. We read this in 1970 of the Catechism, 1970. The law of the gospel, that is, what are we to do? What ought we to do? Requires us to make the decisive choice between the two ways and to put into practice the words of the Lord. It is summed up in the golden rule, Whatever you wish that men would do to you, do so to them. This is the law and the prophets. The entire law of the gospel is contained in the new commandment of Jesus, to love one another as he has loved us. This is the soul of Christian morality, love, caritas. But let's think about, in the words of the song, what is love? What is love? It's not simply affirming the other, it's not simply being with the other, though that is absolutely critical, as we'll mention in a moment. It is, in fact, recognizing what is the purpose of the human being, what is the purpose of their existence, and striving to assist them in the fulfillment of that purpose. What is their end? That's a philosophical term. What's the purpose for their being? What's the end of this pulpit? Not when we throw it out. The end of this pulpit in this kind of language is to be used for the preacher to stand at, to proclaim the gospel. What is the end of the church? Well, not a hundred years from now when the church collapses, heaven forbid. The end of the church is it's a place for worship. It's the place where the Christians gather together in the household of God and worship God in spirit and in truth. What is the end of the human person? Union with God forever. The end of the human person is union with God forever in heaven. Brothers and sisters, when I work with married couples, or rather couples who are preparing for marriage, I always tell them, you will be asked on judgment day, did you bring your spouse closer to me? Did you bring your spouse closer to me? Or did you just have a really nice, fun life, which is great and good? But it's not enough. It's not enough. Those who are married have a radical responsibility to participate in the salvation of their spouse and of their children, to bring them into contact with the true and living God, to help them fulfill the purpose of their life. There is so much, so much loneliness and despair in our world. We know, as we've said before, that child depression is higher than it's ever been before, at least as we are recording it. Even things worse than that, damage done to their own bodies and to themselves out of despair and loneliness. And I think that a critical part of this, one of the reasons why, is because there's a forgetfulness about what it is that we are made for. We are made for not just success in the workplace, not just the alleviation of pain or the avoidance of pain, not just experiences, lots of experiences, lots of mountaintop experiences. No, that's not enough. We must know why we are and the purpose of our existence. 
to be in communion with God. And this is happiness, to know why we are made, to know how we are to act to achieve our end, to fulfill our purpose. Brothers and sisters, happiness, since the very beginning of um, thinking about human action, has always been understood as the principal driving factor of action. Aristotle, Plato spoke about this thousands of years ago. A human person can't not want to be happy. We want to be happy. The trouble is, is that we define happiness in different ways. Some people define happiness as being able to exert your own influence on things. You are independent. That is happiness. Some people would say that happiness is, again, a life without pain, a life without suffering. Others would say that happiness is getting as much physical pleasure as one possibly can. So nobody, nobody would disagree that happiness is our driving factor. Even high school kids. High school kids sometimes who can be real mopey and seem to delight in mopiness. There's an understanding we all long for happiness. It's just how we define happiness. I think Justin spoke about this last month. We as Christians believe that we have the answer. Happiness is knowing that we are made for God, made for love, made for communion. The soul of our moral life is this knowledge of why we are. We come to know that we are loved by God, and this provides meaning to our life, and it drives our action. This is why I am made. I am made for love. I am made to be in communion with the other and to assist my brothers and sisters in the fulfillment of their destiny. Whether I am a priest or a nun or a married person or single, I am to assist my brothers and sisters in being in communion with God because that is why they are made. My brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ, who has come to manifest the love of the Father, has provided us with an example of how we are to live this meaning of our life. Not just checking off boxes, not just fulfilling the commandments as a series of sterile things to do without any soul, without any meaning. Do not kill, do not steal, do not commit adultery. Well, okay, okay, but why not? Because we are made to be in communion with one another and to assist the other in their own relationship with God. And these actions serve as a detriment to the final end of the human person, what it is that they are made for. They serve as distractions. They serve as detriments to the final end of the other and our own end. They do not help us to love. They hinder us in love. That is why they are bad. But Jesus provides not only a word of encouragement and indeed demand that we follow the commandments of the old law animated by love. He also provides us with some new insights New insights from the mountaintop as the new Moses as to how we are to live in communion and the depth of the love that we are to have for one another. They are called the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes, which interestingly enough, of course, come from the word, root, or easy for me to say, root word, Beatitude, Beatitude, to be happy, blessedness. Jesus provides us a way to fulfill our end, how to be happy. But they're very, very strange, aren't they? They're weird because they're not the first activity we would think about in terms of being happy. Blessed are those who mourn. That doesn't sound real happy to me. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Well, that just sounds like an angry person. How do we understand beatitudes in terms of this law of love? How do the Beatitudes, this set of commandments given to us by the new Moses upon the mountaintop, how do they help us understand the full depth of the love that we are to have for one another, to assist one another in our end of union with God? Let me remind you what the Beatitudes are. 1716. The Beatitudes are at the heart of Jesus' teaching. They take up the promises made to the chosen peoples since Abraham. 
The Beatitudes fulfill the promises by ordering them no longer merely to the possession of a territory. God told Abraham, if you do this, I'll give you land. But of the kingdom of heaven, Jesus opens up a new horizon, a glorious vision of what is possible for the Christian to know God, to see God face to face in heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Did you hear that? When you are persecuted, when you are spat upon, when you are misunderstood, rejoice and be glad. Strange, strange things. But if we begin to understand that the end of our life, the true source of our happiness is to be in communion with God, and we recognize that He, God Himself, has endured this as well, we come to understand that in these experiences of suffering, of misunderstanding, of the barrages of human beings in their own littleness and pettiness, we are with God. We walk with Him. We are united to Him. And our end is attained in a small temporary way here on earth. All right, let's talk a little bit about these Beatitudes, the four first ones specifically. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Brothers and sisters, what I'd like to do for these four first Beatitudes, these ways of fulfilling the commandment to love, the end of love, which is our lives, I'd like to examine what they say about love of God and love of neighbor. Love of God and love of neighbor. Wax on, wax off. All right. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poverty of spirit is over and over again spoken by the saints as lying at the heart of holiness. To be poor in spirit, to be humble, to be aware that everything that we have is a gift of God. How does poverty of spirit address, amplify, unveil love of God? All of us are children of the Father, children of the Father. We are not good. We are not saved. We are not talented because of our own efforts. These are gifts given by God. Critical, critical revelation. I believe in Jesus Christ because God himself has given me the grace to believe in Jesus Christ. Now we touch upon some very complicated, challenging issues here. Because everything that we are that is good within us is a gift given by God, including our faith, what do we say about those with no faith? That's a mystery for a different topic. What we know is what we have received, the gift of God in faith, in hope, and in charity through baptism. No Christian can look down upon another with eyes of judgment upon the person, we can judge actions, but upon the person, because everything that is good of ours is a gift. It is a gift. You know, as a child growing up, I remember being incredibly miserly with all the stuff that my parents had given me. I didn't buy it. I didn't work for it. They were just given to me by my parents. And yet some, because of the fact that I am a son of Adam, these gifts given to me by my parents, boy, I held on to them. They were mine. They're mine. No, they're not. They were given to you by your parents. You know, we think about, think about uh, kids and you know, their own desire for their room. You know, this is my room. Well, actually, it's under my roof, kid, but that's another story. These are things that are given to us as gifts, the gift of faith, the gift of life, given to us by God. 
So brothers and sisters, poverty of spirit opens up for us a revelation. We are dependent upon the Father, the Father. Are there blessings within our life? Of course there are. Many challenges, but many blessings. Look to your beloved children if you want to be reminded. Gifts given by God. Everything we have is given by God. How does this address this poverty of spirit, our love of neighbor? As we look upon our brothers and sisters, we recognize that they are like us. Everything good in their life has been given by God, and they themselves are willed by God. We are all united together in the fact that we have come from God and are going back to God. In the beginning of the Bible, when Adam opens his eyes after Eve is taken from his side, his first words, beautiful, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. As we've said many times before, this is not just the expression of romantic love. It's the expression of all love, the foundation of all love. This one is like me. This one is like me. How often we get ourselves into trouble when we put people into boxes. They're not like me. They think this way. They vote that way. They're not like me. Yes, they are. In their hunger for love, in their eternal destiny, in their challenges and in their desires, they are just like you. And poverty of spirit allows us to recognize in the other one like ourselves. Poverty of spirit helps us to recognize that we are children of the Father, we are receivers of good gifts from God, and we recognize in our brother and our sister a beggar like us. All of us come to God as beggars, beggar children who require everything to be given to us by God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is a tough one. Blessed are those who mourn. Tell that to the mom who has to lay to rest her young child. Say that to a, a spouse who has lived 60 years of his life with a woman who has defined his very existence and now is gone. Blessed are those who mourn. Come on, Jesus, get real. And yet we know here that the Lord is speaking again in a way that is rooted in our fundamental destiny, our fundamental dignity, and that is to assist others in coming to know the true and living God. The Beatitudes do not guarantee, the Christian way of life does not guarantee that our life will be without suffering or without pain. In fact, quite the contrary, we're guaranteed that there will be suffering and pain. There will be the cross. And indeed, to mourn is a price of authentic love. To mourn is a price of authentic love. To be untouched by the sufferings of others, to be untouched by the wounds of others, is not love. It's not love at all. We have not allowed ourselves yet to be impacted by them. We have not grown in communion with them, which is the only way to assist them in their final destiny of knowing God face to face in heaven. To mourn, how does mourning, how does this amplify, manifest, or unveil for us love of God? Brothers and sisters, I would offer, blessed are those who mourn for their sins. Blessed are those who have tears of compunction, to use a word that we use in Lent here. Tears of repentance. What a beautiful thing, tears of repentance. Sometimes we can be lulled into sort of a false sense of, of, uh, of comforting other people. Oh, it's okay. It's all right. What you did isn't such a big deal. Yes, it is. You have betrayed the confidence of others. You have failed in your duty. You have not loved as you are called to love. And we shouldn't whitewash things. We should cry out, I have fallen. I have failed. I got to admit to you, and don't let this dissuade you from coming to confession, if you want to get Father Erickson kind of worked up, okay? If you want to get Father Erickson 75% Irish blood kind of boiling, come into confession and say, you know, Father, I'm pretty much a good person. <clears throat> no, you ain't, okay? All of us, all of us have fallen short of the love to which we are called. Blessed are those who mourn for their sins who acknowledge that what they have done has done real damage to other people. 
Blessed are those who can mourn that, who can recognize the distance between where I am and where God wants me to be. And blessed are those who shed tears of repentance that are such a beautiful sign of our desire for holiness. We don't stay there. We don't stay in our guilt. But it's important to acknowledge, I messed up. I have not done what I ought to do. Blessed are those who mourn for their sins. But also, blessed are those who mourn for others, who mourn with others. This touches upon love of neighbor. Do we experience the sufferings of others? Are we willing to be inconvenienced by them? Are we willing to take on to ourselves the sufferings of others? Brothers and sisters, I want to admit to you something that is shameful, but something that's very true in my own life as a son of Adam. When I get a sick call at 4 o'clock in the morning, my first response is not, yippee, I get to go bring Jesus to someone. It is, oh, come on, can't this wait? Come on, come on, give me four or five more hours, will you? Brothers and sisters, I experience this because I do not love well. Because there is within me stubbornness and laziness. Because I do not yet mourn as I ought with my brothers and sisters. You think the one who's making that phone call, who's watching their parent die before their eyes, you think that they're not mourning? But how about in your own life? Enough about me, huh? Enough about me. How about in your own life? Are you willing to be inconvenienced by your homebound mother or father? Do you take time to visit them and sacrifice your own comfort or your own time? Do you take time to listen to your brother or your sister as they talk for like the tenth time about their suffering? Are you willing to be there with them? Are you willing to endure the jeers of the crowd as you say no to gossip, as you turn away from those who would destroy others with their tongue? Are you willing to turn away and to be thought of as odd or weird? Are you willing to mourn and to experience that, that inconvenience of the gospel? Brothers and sisters, are we willing to suffer for love? Are we willing to mourn with others? If not, it ain't love. If we're not willing to suffer for the sake of the other, it's warm, fuzzy feelings, it's sentiment, which doesn't mean anything doesn't mean anything. Good intentions are not enough. We must love in spirit and truth, which means we are willing to mourn with the other in their suffering. All right, in light of time constraints, we'll stick with just a third more. We'll, we'll cover the fourth one perhaps next month. The third beatitude. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is also another strange one like mourning. Happy are the meek. What this does not mean is we walk around with our head bow low and we become doormats. The Christian is not called to be a doormat. Yes, we're called to be crucified, but we're not called to be walked over, okay? To be meek does not mean to be a doormat. What does it mean then? What does meekness mean? It seems to me that meekness here refers to docility. Are we willing to be led? Are we willing to be formed? Are we willing to be shaped? Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who are shaped by the potter's hand. Blessed are those who do not become stubborn and obstinate so that they break as God works them with his hands. Blessed are the docile. Blessed are those who are willing to be open to formation those who are willing to be formed. So many, so many of us assume that we do not need more formation. And this happens in the Christian way of life a lot. You know, I went to Catholic school. I went to high, Catholic high school. I went to Catholic college. Come on, I, I don't need more formation. I don't need it. What job? What job would allow you in a professional capacity to go through your entire life without further formation? Not a job that you would want to entrust your life to. 
nurses, doctors, lawyers. These are all individuals who must go through continuing formation, continuing ed. And yet we think that, you know, a parochial school education or faith formation programs is enough for our understanding of the greatest thing in our entire life, our faith. No, it's not enough. We must be meek. We must be open to continuing formation, even when it's given by a young whippersnapper like Father J.P.E. We're called to be open to formation. Meekness, open to God's formation, open to God's word, open to God's direction. You must love your enemy. You must love the poor. You must give sacrifice on Sundays, every Sunday coming to Mass. You must seek and strive to form your children in the faith. These are the commandments given by God. Are we meek to them? Are we, are we open to them? Meekness and our relationship with others. Are we sensitive to others' needs? Are we open to an awareness, to a sensitivity of what others need? This can be hard sometimes because sometimes what people need can seem rather exhausting they can desire and need our compassion, our patience, our love. Are we open to the needs of our neighbor? Or, or the only thing that we are aware of is our own needs, our own comfort, our own satisfaction. This is not love. We must be meek to the needs of others, especially our spouses. Maybe they just need some time with you. Maybe they just need some words of comfort. Not words reminding them what they haven't done, but remind them how much you love them. Maybe your children need this. Maybe you yourself need to reflect upon your own um, lack of openness to the sufferings of others and of their own needs. Brothers and sisters, what does it mean to be happy? It means to see God face to face in heaven. That is, the, that is the, the real meaning of happiness for every single human being. And we are called to assist one another in the fulfillment of that end. To do so, to help others in their own knowledge of God, we must be in communion with them. We must be willing to enter into their lives. We must accompany them. We can't simply look at them from afar. We must be with them. Let us pray for the grace and the strength this holy season of Lent to be with one another so that we might help all of us get to heaven and be with God, our ultimate source of happiness. Again, I want to wish you all a very blessed Lent. And don't forget those three activities. Prayer, Stations of the Cross on Fridays, right here, 7 o'clock. Fasting, giving up sweets or TV shows or a particular activity uh, that we might be overly attached to as a family. And then third, almsgiving. What will we do as a family and as individuals to serve the poor in our midst? And then confession. Would love to see you all or hear you all in confession sometime during the holy season of Lent. Let's kneel for a, uh, a glory be.